What is the most important miniatures company in the history of Dungeons & Dragons? We're going to answer that question on today's Top 10 video. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer. This is our channel, Old School Rules, where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards who like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. Today's video is counting down the top 10 miniatures companies from the early era of Dungeons and Dragons. Hope you enjoy the video. In the early era of Dungeons and Dragons, a number of companies began producing miniatures for use with fantasy RPGs. Today we're counting down my top 10 list. Uh, it's certainly by no means scientific. Uh, I'll give you the criteria I use to come up with my list here in just a minute. I remember looking at miniatures in the mail order hobby shop catalog, uh, seeing all these different great miniature sculptures we could use, thinking about which ones I'd like to buy. I've got a pretty decent collection at this point, uh, and in some future videos I'll probably do a closer look at some of the, maybe some of the companies or some particular videos that they produced. Before we start our countdown, let's sort of rewind to where this all gets started. You will remember uh, in the early history of D&D, before we even had D&D, we had Chainmail. And Gygax and Perrin wrote these rules, which they titled, subtitled, Rules for Medieval Miniatures. Right? And so that is, uh, the, the concept of miniatures was there before the game even began. And on the cover of the original Woodgrain box, it says, Rules for Fantastic Medieval War Games, Campaigns Playable with Paper and Pencil, and Miniature Figures. So the idea of, of having miniatures has been with us as long as before we even had Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, this is, I think in some respects, a topic where you might not have them in the same order, but probably your top five or top 10 are similar to mine, at least mostly the same. Uh, but it's not you know, the easiest topic in the world. There are, there, as I'll show you in just a minute, there are a lot of companies to consider. So what did I look at? Solid metal, uh, I sort of think of them as the lead era. Uh, these are what they call in the in the uh, in the hobby pre slaughter So there's like a solid circular base. Uh, I only looked at companies that had a fantasy line, or sort of judged them based on their fantasy line. So if you had um, traditional European war games, etc., I don't really take a look at those in terms of my evaluation. They had to be companies that existed and were producing in the in sort of the late mid to late 70s to early 80s. Um, quality and quantity both are important. So um, the, the quality of the sculptures that you had, sort of, or the uh, if you had some that were particularly famous or well known or well recognizable, and also the quantity of the line or collection. So, how many different types of miniatures did you produce? And finally, at what I call enduring collectability, how well known is your company? How desirable are those um, early era miniatures today? Now, some companies uh, continue to have their work produced; others no longer seem to be in production. Where I know a little bit about that, I'll, I'll mention it. As I said, there are a lot of companies to choose from. I'll get myself out of the way. This is from a website called uh, the Lost Mini Wiki, and I'll talk about that at the end. But you can see here just a list. Now some of these are more recent, but just to give you an idea of how many different companies are out there, you can see that there are a lot of different miniature companies to choose from. Here's one that didn't make the list. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons, in, in many ways, is the driver behind the growth in this industry that happened in the late 70s and early 80s. And TSR gave the rights to utilize Dungeons & Dragons to a number of companies, and we'll mention that. But towards the end, they sort of pulled that back in-house and wanted to make their own miniatures. And so they had these uh, boxes here um, of miniatures, and they, they did some blisters as well. Uh, I didn't particularly love their miniatures. I mean, the um, the blisters are two packs, three packs, have some very good uh, iconic monsters in them, and they did characters as well. But all in all, based in particular on the volume and somewhat on the quality, uh, they did not make the top ten list. All right, so let's pull back the curtain and begin our review of the top ten miniature companies of the early D&D era. Our first company coming in here at uh, number 10 is called Dragon Tooth uh, Miniatures. They were founded by Tom Loback and um, uh, originally the Tom Loback General Artwork Company and then later Dragon Tooth. They made uh, a number of 
different types of miniatures here you can see a catalog as well as some um, drawings that they had in, in that catalog they had about a dozen different lines that they did uh, their dragons frankly were quite good I thought so you see this one here it's titled D76 and then they had like a multi-headed hydra which is more of a snake uh, and then they had some really fun big ones over here they've got uh, I think they have a guy named Horny and then they've got a uh, hill giant and uh, the guy riding the Triceratops was one of my favorites uh, and they also had one I think her name was Big Meg she's not shown here but she was a really large miniature uh, sort of naked troll lady who had a wooden spoon well I thought it was a wooden spoon and a pot that she was carrying and so if you've ever seen Big Meg uh, she was kind of hard to forget number nine is uh, I call them Rafam R-A-F-M company this is a company from Canada founded in 1977 uh, but probably began the, their miniatures in the fantasy world about 1979. Um, th like I said, they, they were in Canada, they distributed for other companies like Ralph Partha Citadel and others. They produced a number of lines um, that could be in the fantasy genre. A lot of those come on a little bit later in this era. But for me, the thing that I always associated with them was this thing called the Reptiliads. They had these little reptile men, they had this. Um, fairly well recognizable giant turtle world war turtle and then they even had some books uh, they produced to talk about the reptiliads and so uh, for me that's the thing I always associate uh, most particularly with that company number eight on our list uh, this company is also located in the United Kingdom this is Denizen miniatures and they were started in 1982 uh, still in business still producing I've ordered some figures from them as recently I think it's the last year or two uh, Chubb Pearson is the person who founded and continues to run that company. And um, my favorite things they have are these dwarves, which have some interchangeable parts, so you can really design exactly the, the figure that you're looking for. And then this Legion of the Damned, for me, uh, and I love skeletons, I love undead, but these are probably some of the best undead uh, miniatures in, in the game, especially if you were trying to build a really impressive looking sort of skeleton warrior type of an army. Uh, these would be my first choice for sure. Number seven on our list is Martian Metals. Uh, Martian Metals was founded by Forrest Brown in 1976, mostly doing military miniatures. Um, he's also the primary sculptor, but then uh, later on got into producing fantasy figure lines as well. Uh, one of the things that's distinctive, they tend to have a hexagonal base and um, later on they become part of the Stokey's game, game Science sort of empire, right? Some of the famous things that they did, uh, they had the Dragon Slayers line, which are quite good, both 15 and 25 millimeter sizes. They had this World of Fantasy line and the Rune Quest line, which has like some brew and some other really interesting characters that I like a lot. And they did some miniatures specifically designed for the fantasy trip. Not a huge uh, number of miniatures, but the things they made I think were were really quite quite good Okay, number six on our list I'll probably start to get to an area where people are a little controversial because people maybe have different favorites Asgard miniatures um, Sort of a really important company in the history of miniatures this company is started by Brian Ansel Who will come back to in a minute? He becomes very important in the world of miniatures uh, for quite a long time he founded the company, Brian did, with uh, Paul Sully and Stephen Fitzwater, 1976, so right around the time D&D is coming out. Uh, they wrap up their business in, in the 80s, as we'll see, in part because of Brian's departure, I think. Uh, and these are still put out today. They had a few different lines. They did both 15 and 25 millimeter ranges. Um, the I think a lot of the really good ones, in my opinion, are in the 15, 15 millimeter size range but uh, they're still quite good you can see just a smattering here of different things they did a lot of really quality dwarves uh, monsters and uh, I really like their owl bear which is down here on the bottom the bottom left corner all right so now we move into the uh, the top five on the list we'll see if you guys are anywhere close to where I am as this list plays forward the next one for me would be heritage miniatures uh, started in 1974 by Jim Odin. That predates really the Dungeons and Dragons miniature 
boom, if you will, that happened there at the late 70s. Um, they made Hincliffe, they produced Hincliffe models in the United States um, and began making their own stuff in uh, later years. Um, and then, then around 77, they merge in with custom cast and become heritage models. Um, so they had a number of different ranges that they put out. Um, they had the Fantasy Fantastics and the Fantastiques, uh, the Der Kluger spell, if I'm saying that right, which I'm pretty sure I'm not. Um, and then most important for me, they did the Dungeon Dwellers line. I love this line. They had a couple that came in boxes where you paint the miniatures and there was like almost a game that went with it. Um, these were fantastic. I still, to this day, I don't have maybe just one or two miniatures from that line. I'd love to get more of those. I just, I've always thought they, they really captured the early essence of D&D for me. Number four on our list, and now we get into folks who have some, some very direct ties with Dungeons and Dragons. This is Minifigs. Uh, Minifigs founded in the 60s by Neville Dickinson in the United Kingdom. And uh, in 1973, they have a presence set up in New York. Originally historical gaming, right? But then uh, they become a, the official producer for a number of things for Dungeons and Dragons early on. They had the World of Greyhawk line, other fantasy folks, the Valley of the Four Winds, and then these official Dungeons and Dragons um, fantasy figures by Minifigs, which did some really cool ones. And they were right around the time that the Monster Manual came out, and so you'll see they did uh, they did some casting that was directly in line with the Monster Manual AD&D book. So here is the Demogorgon, draw just like the drawing, you know, in the in the book. And then, of course, one of my favorite things about them, they have pig-faced orcs, which are just fantastic. And they have great little kobolds and a whole bunch of series, all of which very true to the drawings from Trompier and um, uh, Sutherland, etc., from, from those original books. Okay. Closer and closer to the, the, to the territory where I'm definitely going to get some disagreement among folks about what I picked, but here we go. Uh, number three for me is going to be Citadel. Citadel is founded in um, in the United Kingdom. They uh, originally were connected to the folks at Games Workshop. Um, they get convinced Brian Ansel to leave Asgard Miniatures and come over and help them run the Citadel manufacturing um, process. And they get, if you read their, their history, they get, give a lot of credit to Brian for his vision, for his drive, his focus on both quality, um, scope and just the whole vision of blowing out this company and making it into a huge success. My favorite part about the Citadel Miniatures line is the um, Fiend Factory. A lot of um, great miniature designs, several that come from the Fiend Folio, which is one of my favorite books, uh, but just a lot of really different miniatures that you don't see in any other line. And so I really appreciated that. And a great number of just like dwarves and and fighters and things like that as well. And then they also had this really cool book called the Citadel Compendium that had not only miniatures but discussion about Warhammer and their fa their fantasy game and some other ideas like that that sort of go beyond just pure creation of miniatures. And of course, you, you probably are aware a Citadel, the Games Workshop, in terms of miniatures, explodes and becomes the number one company in the world uh, under largely under Brian's um, leadership. And one other thing that's I think worth mentioning for Citadel that's important is. Uh, for a period of time, they entered into an agreement, and they were producing and selling the Ralph Partha figures in the United Kingdom and over into into Europe. Um, just as an interesting little point of fact, they say that their the U.S. company they set up um, had uh, six employees in 1981, sold a half million figures, and their shop in the United Kingdom had 30 employees, sold over two million figures in just that one, you know, just that one year. Okay, number two for me is going to be. Grenadier models and Grenadier, one of the largest producers, huge line, tons of sales. Um, they were started in 1972 by Andrew Chernock and Ray Rubin and um, switched the as Canterbury Pewter, changed their name to Grenadier in 1975. Uh, at their largest, they had 40 employees and sold six and a half million figures in, in 1981, which is sort of the, I think, the highlight of their. A lot of companies sort of the peak of the miniature sales. Um, they did a lot of different lines. They did this Wizards and Warriors series. Um, they had an official license from Dungeons and Dragons to do figures. 
they did something they called Dragon Lords and Fantasy Lords. They had a license with um, Lord of the Rings. And Julie Guthrie, who did um, some miniatures for Alpartha, also later, I think later, comes over and joins Grenadier and does some, some work for them. So, uh, th again, they had a really fantastic set of miniatures. These were definitely ones that I, I remember from when I was a kid that I wanted um, to add to my collection. The thing I like the most about Grenadier, and I like their miniatures, but I love their boxes. Um, this art that, uh, that was done by Ray Rubin, um, for me, almost makes it worth collecting just to get the boxes. So initially you have these larger sort of square boxes that they did, uh, all of which are, are just great. Some of these figures get repackaged uh, a little later, and then they did all these rectangular boxes and I'm actually going to get myself out of the way so you guys can see see these boxes without me being there. Um, they did a whole bunch of these um, boxes for, for advanced D&D. &D. Halflings, dwarves, then they had one called hirelings, fighting men, the specialists, the females, the thieves, wizard room which is more of like a little scene set, if you will, uh, then denizens, I think like denizens of the swamp, they had lizard men, swamp man, uh, just great stuff. The orcs lair, which again had some stuff so you could sort of set up a little scene for your adventure, and then dwellers below, which is probably the best one in the of the box sets for me, and then this just generic sort of adventuring party. So we've made it this far, it's probably obvious to anybody who's really into miniatures what my number one choice is going to be. Uh, and that is Rao Partha. Uh, for a ton of reasons. Um, the sculpting was superior in, in a lot of these in terms of the quality. The just variety of different miniatures that they produced. Um, and, for, and for me, this when I was, especially like when I was younger, uh, most of the figures that I just absolutely loved and wished I could have were, were part of this. So Rao Partha Enterprises, founded in 1975. Um, principally Glenn Kidd, who was the president, and Tom Meyer, who is without a doubt, you know, one of the top sculptors of all time, um, was, was a, helping, helped found the company and helped um, do most of the sculpting early on. Uh, again, they did, they had an agreement with Citadel Miniatures where they brought C Citadel Miniatures into the U.S. and then had an agreement where Citadel was producing Ralph Partha figures over there, which certainly, I'm sure, helped their sales figures. Um, they're still produced today. Iron Wind Metals does some of it, and then Ralph Partha Legacy um, also does some of their figures. Thank goodness to, to Jacob. He's running Legacy and has done a fabulous job of um, producing more and more of the figures from the catalog that we all loved from back in the 70s, 80s era, uh, and getting those back into, back into circulation. They had just... Um, the list of their different ranges they had goes on and on and on. You can see all these different kind of um, um, artwork and things they had for the productions. And then, you know, this is from probably my favorite. So I love the Wizards, Warriors, and Warlocks, which was one of Tom Meyer's earliest um, series that he did. It's fairly limited, dwarves, elves, goblins, uh, some trolls. Um, and, and maybe some halflings, depending on how you think about that one. But uh, then he does this personalities and things that go bump in the night. And um, every numbered figure is just is unique. So like, oh, one is this evil wizard. Oh, two is the death dealer uh, mounted. This is like a homage to that Frazetta um, character. Then we've got the Fantasy Collector series where you've got these amazingly detailed sculpted elves. Like no one does elves like Tom Meyer, hands down. Um, he had dwarves, he had goblins, the sea elves, which I love. Uh, and I remember when I was a kid, my all-time favorite figure was the Black Prince. This is a guy down here mounted on this horse. And there's like a whole little collection inside of this um, related to the Black Prince and his, you know, different people that are in his army. So just love, love those figures. Tons of dragons um, also. I mean, nothing says fantasy figures, right, like dragons. And so he has the dragon, the cold drake, the golden dragon, the oriental dragon, the black dragon, the blue dragon, the sea dragon, uh, the undead dragon. And those are just the ones that are inside of the personalities line. And then there are 
at one point later on they do like dragon of the month and um, just an endless number of figures that they created that could be used in connection with your D&D game. And then later on, they actually get a license from, from TSR, and they did a lot of stuff, especially around the Dragonlance stuff. It's considered pretty collectible stuff. You got Heroes, Villains, Lord Soth's Charge, and they did a number of these blisters, especially a bunch of um, people with names, so people from the Forgotten Realms, lore, etc., that, that were, pretty, um, were pretty collectible. If you want to learn more, so that's it for my countdown. Um, if you want to learn more, there's lots of places you can go. The Lost Minis Wiki, hands down the best online, and there's lots of great online resources, but that's the best. It's got all those different companies, ranges, pictures of the uh, different um, figures in there. So just a tremendous resource. And thanks to the guys who ran it. I mean, it is such a contribution to the hobby and to the community. Um, Terrence Gunn has two books on Grenadier, The Fantastic Worlds, and then there's a supplement. Um, for my money, the, you, if you love miniatures, you've got to get this production from the 80s, The Armory's Buyer's Guide to Fantasy Miniatures. It has the, organized in several different ways. It has like the hand drawings of the miniatures for most of the miniature figurines that were being offered at that time from all these different companies and more. It's not horribly expensive to find a used copy on eBay, or if you have a good local bookstore, you might find one there. Uh, it is a fantastic resource. There are great Facebook groups. Um, as I, I typically say, don't always love Facebook itself, but the groups for different interests are a fantastic resource and way to network and talk to people who know more than you do and learn things from them. I'm, I'm in several Facebook groups, and that's where I learn a lot as well. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys, um, if you love miniatures already, I hope this was, was a lot of fun. And if you don't, I hope this will inspire you to go take a little bit more of a closer look at the miniatures that were made in the late 70s, early 80s. And of course, they're still being made today. But for my money, you got to love old lead. Um, and whether you paint or not, uh, I think you could, everyone can admire the amazing sculptures that were created by these artists, really, as I would call them. The people that made these things are absolutely artists, and I, I just absolutely love them. That's it for my top 10 list. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hope you're liking the channel. I hope you're subscribed. Uh, if you have friends who might like our content, please send them our way, and maybe they can become subscribers as well. And until next time, my friends, keep rolling 20s.